a native New Yorker, I apologize to you for the weather. And I welcome you, officially welcome you, to the 9-11 Tribute Center presentation of We Were There. My name is Judith Pucci. I'm a Tribute Center walking tour guide. As you just heard Lee explain to you in the film, we at Tribute are all people whose lives have been directly affected by the events of that day. What Lee didn't tell you is how enormously diverse a group of people we are. We are of vastly different ages. We are of different backgrounds. The diversity is so great that in the normal course of life, many of us would never have met. And now we share a powerful bond. And tribute is what has brought us together. It's where we find support, and it's where we tell our stories about what that day was like from the inside. So this afternoon, you're going to hear two of these stories. They're going to be told to you by the people who lived the events they will be telling you about. And they are my fellow Tribute Center guides. So let me introduce to you, next to me is Caitlin Huzko and Pete Moog. Peter, but by Pete, right? OK. So let's start with Pete. Pete is a retired, now retired, detective with the New York City Police Department. He was assigned to the Technical Assistance Response Unit, which means that he helped provide equipment and technical support on investigations conducted by all bureaus throughout the New York City Police Department. When Pete retired in 2003, he had served his city for 22 years. Caitlin. Caitlin was all of 17 years old when her father responded on September 11th. He was then a 15-year veteran of the Port Authority Police Department. Now, the Port Authority is the agency that manages New York's three major airports, our bridges and tunnels and our ports. So as a Port Authority police officer, Caitlin's father, whose name was Stephen, Stephen helped to enforce the laws at these locations. We're going to begin with Pete's story, so I'm just going to very briefly set the scene for you. Pete's unit, the Technical Assistance Response Unit, is on call, as you can imagine, 24-7. So although Pete was technically off-duty the day of September 11th, as with so many of our first responders, once the attacks began, he went into action. Pete, I'm going to let you take it from there. Okay. All right, the uh, morning of September 11th, we, uh, our unit got called up, and our location was Liberty and West Street. And at that time, both planes had struck the tower, and, you know, uh, there was a very chaotic scene, to say the least, going on as to <clears throat> what was going on and how we were going to mount this unbelievable rescue that was going on in front of us. Um, there was many things happening from uh, people that were actually choosing to jump out of the buildings, which you could see. It wasn't one or two. There was many. And that was just from our view on the west side of the complex. Don't forget the complex is very big as you well see on your different tours. So our job that day now was to <clears throat> now kind of aid the rescue effort with different types of equipment. We have search cameras and pole cameras and listening devices and things that could aid in that fact. Well, at one point now, we're bringing in all our equipment going across West Street, and what we hear is an explosion, we think. But it really isn't an explosion. It's the South Tower beginning to collapse. And we were just standing in the middle of West Street and Liberty, which is southwest corner of the Trade Center. Now, as they turn to run, because we think it's just debris from the airplane, it turns out it's the actual collapse of the building. As the building starts collapsing, you can see it pancaking and this black cloud coming down. Basically, pressure, like a opposite effect like a jack-in-the-box. If you pushed on the jack-in-the-box hard enough, it would blow out to the sides. And that's what was happening with the building. And when it caught up to us, I was a little bit thinner then. So, I mean, it wasn't as big as I am now. So, 
it picked us up and threw us off my feet in the air. I don't know how many feet. I was very surprised at how far it did throw us. Um, I was standing next to my partner, who at the time was less than a foot from me. I no longer could find him. So one of the things that uh, you learn in the police department is sometimes you have to compromise all the things you learn in the police academy. And this is kind of the gist of my story. Now trapped in the corner like a rat under the south pedestrian walkway, smelling bodies burning, smelling all sorts of things and having a very difficult time breathing, one of the guys that I was trapped with had the foresight to fire his gun into a window because downtown, a lot of the windows are very thick, the glass, you know, more than a, a foot thick, some of them, especially on the lower floors. We're trapped under the South Pedestrian Walkway, which is the only piece of the Trade Center that's still left standing out there. You can still see it. If it had collapsed like the North, I would be dead. And some other guy, at least 12 others that were with me. So this one guy, Tim McGinn, takes out his firearm and he fires some rounds into the window and we're able to save ourselves by getting into this lobby of the Oppenheimer building, One World Financial, which is across the street. So now we gather ourselves up quickly, try and figure out what's going on. So we have to go out again because now we're missing original people that were standing close to us. So we go out and, you know, that's one of the things that they tell you never to do. Never fire your gun, never fire your gun, never fire your gun. Last resort, last resort. So Timmy, thank God, tried it. I was standing there with my hammer, my whatever I had in my hand, my helmet, my radio, trying to break the window to get in. Wouldn't work, like other guys. So now all of a sudden, we get outside and find out what are we trying to do. Okay, we hear people calling for help. We can hear some of the firemen. They have a non-movement alarm that goes off on their Scott pack. It's a very piercing sound. You can hear it going off all over the place. Then we move in a group trying to get it done. The guy yells, look out, the North Tower's collapsed. You know, it seems like a long time when you're out there working, but in essence, it was very short. Now we have this black cloud coming at us again. Doesn't blow us off our feet as much as the sec uh, first one because we're further away. So now we get back into the game after we get out of a parking garage, and now all of a sudden we're sitting on a park bench down by the water, covered in white, can't see, can barely see. So we need some water, we need some type of water. So what do we do? We kind of compromise our rules again. We break into a deli, we throw something through the window, we go in and get some bottles of water, we wash our eyes out. We're sitting on a park bench, and now I hear this roar of another jet coming in. I'm with 15 or 20 guys, so I turn around, I get off my butt, and I go over to a mailbox, I take some cover, I point up my gun at this loud noise coming at me from the south. And they're all laughing, and I'm standing there. What are you laughing at? You're going to shoot down that F-16 with your peace shooter? You know, because it was one of our jets finally coming through. It was a fighter jet. They realized it was, and I didn't. But I figured I'd go at least with fire in one shot anyway. So, <laughs> But um, it was a little humor at the point, and we got, you know, able to go. So... Now we get back with our groups, and now we're assigned to our different tasks of rescue, uh, recovery, rescue, excuse me. So now we have to get many cameras to point in the void. You know, all wasn't just muscle. It all wasn't just picking things up and moving them, whether it was a, with a grappler or something like that. When you got close and you thought somebody might be alive or there might be something there, you'd want to make a good look. So we had these pole cameras. But they weren't very flexible. They were very inflexible. So again, our ingenuity comes in, and a couple of the guys say, hey, why don't we get fiber optic camera on a line and tape it with some duct tape to some fishing poles that are you know, a little flexible, and we can get into voids and get a little further down than we can now. Well, it turns out there's Paragon Sports up on Broadway, so what did we do again? <laughs> we broke in. <laughs> Got a couple of fishing poles. We came back. Did our duct tape. So those were some of the three different things that we did that really compromised and made us grow into different types of people. But at the time, you wanted to make sure that you accomplished the goal, which was aiding in the rescue. And, you know, it wasn't like we didn't tell the guy, hey, we broke in, we took these things, and we made sure, you know, we left the cop there and secured the scene. So 
it wasn't like it was just lawlessness breaking in, but we were able to achieve a couple of things and get those things, those things going. And as you know, the rescue, they, it proved to be very helpful. Maybe not me shooting at the F-16, but everything else did. And you know, the story is a long story, but wrapping it up quicker is one of the first times that I left the zone, we called it, anything south of Canal Street, which was basically the frozen zone, was the day after. Now, many people may not think this, but a lot of people don't like police officers, you know, which has always been the case in New York, which sometimes you see, sometimes you don't. You know, firemen, they come, they help you, they put the fire out. Cop, what do you do? They lock you up, give you a ticket, take your dad away, take your mom away, something like that. So, not everybody likes it. But when I left that zone, going north to Canal Street, covered in dust, there were people lined up all the way up West Street. So, and I'm looking, what are, they, what are they doing up there? What's going on? And it's average Joes, average Moes, everybody just lined up cheering for whoever come out of that zone. All New Yorkers, whether they were from anywhere in New York, anywhere, wherever they were from in the world, they were up there cheering for us. Cops and whoever came out of the zone. A guy came running over to me with a tray of baked ziti, handed us a baked ziti tray. <laughs> Another guy's waiting, you need cash? I'm like, what do you need cash for? I'm like, get out. I'm like, get that. Another guy had a pair of boots he handed out. But that's kind of like the spirit of New York. They didn't ask whether I was, you know, a cop or a fireman. Some probably knew because, you know, we had a police car or whatever. But some didn't know. Uh, some did They didn't care. They just wanted to know that there was somebody alive and that they helped. So that was my biggest thing about 9-11. It wasn't just a one operation that was done by rescue workers. It was done by everybody. It was done by New Yorkers, people from all over the world. Cards and letters that we answered were from all over the world. Uh, like the, when you went into the Red Cross tent after a while and they would say to you, oh, could you answer a letter? You'd stand there and you'd answer like, oh, dear fireman or policeman, thank you for helping or, you know. So you wrote a letter to the kindergarten kids or whoever wrote the letter. And it was uh, very rewarding. And one of the most rewarding things was coming out of that dust and muck and mire and seeing people cheering for cops and handing us the big CD. So it was pretty amazing that uh, things that metamorphosis that uh, New Yorkers and everybody else can go through in times of trouble. So if we can get through all that, we can certainly get through anything else in life. And uh, thank you for your time and thanks for coming. New York City police officers, 23. 23 New York City police officers are killed on September 11th. Since then, more have become sick because of the toxins that they were exposed to that day and throughout the nine months it took to clear the site of debris after the attacks. Caitlin. Like Pete. Caitlin's father raced to the Trade Center that day. He had just finished working a night shift at Newark Airport, which is in New Jersey. And then he rushed in to the city. And Caitlin, it's all yours. Um, funny story about that, actually. Um, my father might be alive today had he been where he was supposed to be. Um, he, um, he had just finished a shift, um, but uh, he went to the tech center, which is right outside the Holland Tunnel on the Jersey side. Um, and he went there because he had a pet project at Newark Airport. Um, he wanted to install defibrillators, which are there today. If you take a flight from Newark Airport, you will see them installed all along the halls. Um, and that was his pet project. He really felt it was important to have that, um, that safety feature. So he went to see a man about a horse that day, about, you know, the, um, the defibrillators, and he went out with the Holland Tunnel tech center guys. Um, two buses went out, and only one came back. Um, that's my dad's story. My story begins the day before. Um, I had just come home from school, 
and um, it was early, early, early in the semester. And um, that evening, I, I was a lifeguard in high school, and uh, I had to get recertified for my CPR. And coincidentally, my father taught the CPR course at the local hospital. He always was volunteering. Um, my dad was very, very, very active in the community. He was a Cub Scout leader. He was a t-ball coach. He just got involved anywhere he could um, because you know he felt that was important. Um, and he, you know, volunteered at the hospital too. Now that day we had to leave early because he was also going to donate blood. I'm not embellishing. <laughs> he was donating blood that same day. Um, so he. Uh, we hopped into the car they had just purchased for me for my 17th birthday. Um, I was not licensed to drive it yet. I still had my learner's permit. So since it was downpouring, he said, I will take the wheels. You can drive home. Um, so we rushed off, and we stopped for gas. Uh, and he ran in, I guess, for a bottle of water or something. Um, and he saw a bicyclist, a stranded bicyclist, in this downpour at a payphone, and he's calling and calling and not getting through. Apparently nobody was home to pick him up. So my dad, always with a smile, always willing to strike up a conversation, offer to help, where do you live? Oh, that's on the way. Why don't you put the, you know, next thing I know, the trunk's open, the bicycle's in, the guy gets in behind me, and off we go. Um, so we dropped him off, and, um, mm -hmm. and then we went to the hospital. He donated blood. We did our CPR course, and um, and it was great. And I was I was proud of the fact that my dad was teaching. You know, my dad volunteered for his time, and it was really it was lovely because I, I grew up in a big household. I was one of four, and um, getting time one on one with a parent was kind of hard. So getting to spend that night with him was pretty special. But we drove home that night, this time I got to drive. Um, and we listened to the radio, and I wish with all my heart I could share what we talked about that day. Um, but it was very unremarkable. I had no idea how remarkable it would be that I got to spend that last night with him. Um, so we got home. I finished up the rest of my homework. <laughs> I went to bed. He went to work. And um, the next day, I was at school. And we were living out in Jersey, all out on the Pennsylvania side of Jersey. And our high school treated it like nothing was happening. They just kept it under wraps, kept classes going, kept us going <clears> through, <throat> and released us on time. Um, the only thing we heard at all was from teachers talking about it, who had been in the teacher's lounge and the AV lounge and, you know, who knew what was going on. We were kept very, very in the dark about it. Um, so I only got it in bits and pieces. So all I could tell was, okay, the towers are gone, but Dad's there helping. Dad's there cleaning up. Dad's, you know, he's, he's there helping with the rescue effort. I, I didn't know anything. I got home, um, and I knew to look for the message, um, because Dad also responded to the 93 bombings at the World Trade. And my mom knew, you got to check for the message. There was no message. I couldn't tell if that was cause for alarm or not, but my mom got home from work, and I could tell something was up. Um, so we watched it on television. We, well, I wasn't there. <laughs> My dad was. Pete was. <laughs> um, but I remember staying up that night with my mom. Three little guys had all gone to bed. They were 13, 7, and 5 at the time. Um, and they all went to bed, but I stayed up because I knew something was wrong. Something was very wrong. And we stayed up together, and my mom's friends came over to wait with us, and we waited for that phone call, and waited for that phone call, and um, it never came. We never, we never knew what happened. Um, so my mom decided, all right, we have to, 
we have to have some closure, we have to put this behind us. We had a memorial service on October 20th, 2001 for my dad. Um, my brother and I both spoke. And, um, and we put it behind us. Um, but always remembering, um, always remembering that spirit of helping, of charity. My, um, five months later, in February of 2002, we, uh, we had been out skiing, one of my dad's favorite things to do with us. It was one of our favorite things to do with dad. Um, and this time I had to teach the five-year-old to ski. That was my job this year. <laughs> and um, we had gotten home and the four kids, the four of us kids were exhausted. My mom always sat in the lounge and read a book. But <laughs> we were all exhausted. We headed off to bed, passed out. The next morning, I could hear my mom on the phone, and I knew that tone. I had grown to know that tone over the last five months. And then I came downstairs to see there was a single wine glass on the table, and I knew it was the Port Authority chaplain <laughs> who had been there, and I just knew what had happened um, immediately. They had found him. Um, we had another funeral. Um, and I found out much later, he was found, well, first I found out he was found only 24 inches from the exit um, of the South Tower. And um, they were, he and four other colleagues were carrying a, wo a woman in a handicapped chair um, and assisting her out of the building uh, when the building fell. But much later, I found out how he was actually found. Um, his body was wrapped around one of his colleagues, um, which says that in his very, very last moments, um, his last thought was of somebody else. And I'm very proud of him for that. Um, and uh, I also, <laughs> I mean, he's a hero. We all know that. There are so many heroes that day, but what makes me so proud of my dad was that he didn't need to give his life to be a hero. He was a hero to that bicyclist that day. He was a hero to me. He was a hero to my brothers. He was a hero to a lot of different lives that he touched throughout his 44 years. And um, his favorite movie was um, Pay It Forward. He had just, it had just been released in the year or two before he had died. And um, he thought that idea was just wonderful. And he really encouraged us to live by that kind of creed. And, and I encourage you to pay it forward for Stephen Husko. Um, he was my hero, and you can be a hero for somebody else. Um, I thank you for coming, and I thank you for listening. That's how many Port Authority police officers are killed on September 11th. So, 37 Port Authority police, 23 New York City police officers, and 343 New York City firefighters. So we all know, even if you didn't know the numbers before today, you knew that this city's first responders had paid a tremendous price that day. What many of us don't realize is that Caitlin is one of a little over 3,000 children who had a parent die on September 11th. What I would like to do now is open this up to you. If you have any questions for Peter Caitlin, this is your moment, so please don't be shy. Oh, you're being shy. <laughs> Let me just repeat the question. The question was about Caitlin's uh, siblings. How are her brothers doing? That? They're great. <laughs> They're great. Um, the 26-year-old, Liam, I'm very proud to say, is a Port Authority police officer. He graduated in August, and they took my dad's badge number out of retirement, and he uses it today. Um, and we're so, so proud of him. Um, Cullen is a junior at Plymouth State University, and he's studying criminal justice. And Aiden, the smart one, <laughs> is, uh, is at Eckerd College, and he's studying marine biology. As of right now, he's a freshman, so 
The jury's still out, but he's, they're all doing very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a generous thing when people tell their stories, so it's very much appreciated. I would also, before we wrap this up, I really would like to thank all of you. I suspect that you have no idea of the important part that you play in this. You are actually essential to our storytelling, because it is with you that we take a piece of that brutal day and we make from it a life-affirming experience. We hope that what you have heard here today will enrich your time at the museum. So on behalf of Tribute, on behalf of Pete, Caitlin, and me, this is quite sincere, from the heart. Thank you for choosing to spend some of your time with us. <laughs>